Cavalcade of America, presented by DuPont. As far back as the beginnings of our country, chemical science played an important part in our civilization. This evening, the Cavalcade of America, presented by DuPont, relates the story of the country's first chemist, the New England gentleman, John Winthrop. As his experiences are unfolded, you will gain a new understanding of the tremendous handicaps under which the pioneer chemist worked 300 years ago. Also, when you think of the comforts and conveniences for which chemistry has been responsible, you will have a better appreciation how chemists are continually striving to create a new and better America by improving present products and developing entirely new ones. The ideal of the great chemical industries of today is aptly expressed in the DuPont phrase, better things for better living through chemistry. As an overture, Don Voorhees and his orchestra will play a special setting of two old English songs, Drink to Me Only With Thine Eyes and Sally in Our Alley.
In the year 1635, in a simple house in Boston, John Winthrop the Younger, eldest son of the first governor of Massachusetts, is in the midst of an experiment in a room in his house, the first chemical laboratory in the new land. His wife, Elizabeth, is busy nearby at her spinning wheel. It is hard to keep the house clean, John, with all those kettles and pots lying around. Now bear with me, little Elizabeth. In time, I'll have a place for such things. Till then, I needs must use this room. I mind not, John. Only it's trouble enough anyway to keep things clean here in the new world. Oh, I have patience, good wife. Sometimes it seems so hard to do without the things we had in England. We'll get them all in time. But if only we could have a few of them now. I look at this cap. Once it was white, and now for want of these soap, it's nearer gray. The same with all our linens. No amount of washing turns them clean and white. It will not always be thus. Oh, John, we've given up home and country, all that's dear to us for this new land. Must we now even give up cleanliness? Must this new world be a gray world? Not for long, I trust. Elizabeth, I've been experimenting with potters. That's what I use these kettles for. Hi. And soon, I hope to have good soap for all the Bay Colony. Oh, dear. That is not certain yet, but soon it... Hello. Come in. Well, good day, Mistress Winthrop. Good day, Master Barclay. Where's John? Why? Oh, there you are. Still stirring kettles. Yeah, there's much to be done yet, Edwin. And still more to be done outside. You spend too much time on this foolishness, John. There's land to be cleared. And seed planted and houses built. And soap to be made. Oh, so that's the meaning of all this mess. And soon, Edwin, I think we'll have soap as good as any in England. Well, better or worse, it's still soap. And soap's a luxury in the Bay Colony. You should put your efforts to better uses, John. There's no place here for this foolishness of yours. There's a place for anything that fills a need, Edwin. And our needs are great. Some of them can only be met through the science of chemistry. John Winthrop the Younger stuck steadfastly to his belief. He produced potash that made the first really serviceable soap in the New World. He made pitch and tar and started the prime trade in naval stores. Slowly, the struggling young colony grew stronger, sank its roots deeper into the soil of the new land. And then a fateful day in the history of the Bay Colony arrives. A ship just in from England drops anchor off the coast of Massachusetts, and the joyful colonists rush down to the shore to get the long-awaited supplies so necessary to their existence in the new world. Why, look, Edwin, look. Is it not a sight to gladden your eyes? An English ship at anchor after all this time. Aye, John. She's been long enough overdue. It is six months since she sailed for England with our furs and hide. Aye, six long months. But now our waiting's at an end, Edwin. Thanks to Providence. There's not so much as one handful of seed wheat left in the whole colony. We could ill have waited longer. Another week and we'd have missed the planting. <laughs> look, John, look. They've lowered the ship's longboat. Aye, and the surf will bring them straight onto the beach here. God grant the waves do not overturn the boat. Uh, Methinks they've loaded her too heavy. And we could ill lose one sack of seed. Uh, there are so many things we lack. Uh, what do you need most, John? Oh, all manner of things, mainly glassware, crucibles, alembics, all sorts of scientific instruments. Instruments? You call such things important? I must have them to carry on my chemical work. You place too much importance on such things, John. Oh, I know you've made good soap, but we can live without such things. Just seed and lead and tools we cannot live without. And I cannot live without chemicals and scientific instruments. They are my tools. <laughs> look, Edwin, look. Look how they manage the longboat. Why, oh, it bears skims over the water. Aye, but they're not ashore yet. Oh, they've not far to go now. The next breaker should bring them in. Master Watson! Yes? Lend a hand there as they come in. That I will, Master Winthrop. Give your oars, my hearties. All right, All right quick now. Steady, huh? I've got this thing. All right. All right. There are. Right. That's it. Yes. Oh, thank you, Master. Now, if you'll give a pull all together, we'll beach the high and dry. All together now. Once again. There she is. Safe and sound. And everything dry and ship shape in her, too. All right, hearties, turn to and unload the boat. That's it. 
is good to see you again, Master Higgins. The colony had almost given your ship up as lost at sea. Well, it's none too easy across another Mr. Winthrop. Here we are. Glad to set foot on land again, too. Did your captain remember to bring the instruments I specially requested? Well, I don't know as how he brought all you with, sir. But I need everything I ordered. I have nothing here. Why didn't he fill my order? Well, you'll have to ask the captain that yourself, Master Winthrop, when he comes ashore. Uh, strange. Well, there must be some misunderstanding. There's something of yours, Master Winthrop. Oh, good. Take that small box out next, lad. Handle it easy now. Uh, thank you, Master Higgins. I'll have to make out with what you brought as best I may. Yes, there's a lot more. I'll have to do that too, Master Winthrop. Uh, where are my tools? Have you got three kegs and nails? No, not so fast, sir. Let me check off what's in the boat first. You'll get your supplies big enough now. I have the list right here. Uh, Master Atkinson, one sack of seed wheat. One sack of seed wheat. There it is, sir. But where's the other sack? I sent for two. That's all there is. But there must be another somewhere. Nope. Master Barclay, one keg of nails. One keg of nails. Right. Master Bennett. Hold on there. I'm to get three kegs of nails. That's all I've got you down for, Master Barclay. You mean you didn't bring the other two? That's right. But I sent furs enough for three. I've waited six months and for them. And my orders are to give you one keg. That's all. Only one. There's some trickery here. What's your captain done with the rest of the money from our furs? Master Watson. Two bars of lead, one long knife. Two bars of lead, one long knife. There's twice as much. Still do me. And by my account. Well, where's the balance? That's all there is. We've been tricked. The captain's a rogue. Hey! Hey! hey. Uh, captain, in, your captain will have to answer for this. We'll have him up before the council. I know. I know. I know. The ship had come from England, but it had brought less than half the things the colonists had ordered six months before and needed so desperately. Angry, upset, they called upon the elder Winthrop, who was then governor, demanding an investigation. An emergency meeting of the executive council is called, and the master of the ship summoned to appear. Please, gentlemen, please, come to order. Captain? Yes, sir. You have been called here to answer for your misdoings. I have done not, Governor Winthrop. There are those of us who think differently in the matter. Six months ago, you were commissioned to carry a full cargo of hides and furs for trade in London. Aye, and this day I brought back the goods requested by your lordship. Yet you brought scarce half the goods to us. Aye, I sent furs enough for three kegs of nails and got but one back. And I lack half the tools I ordered. Where's my seed wheat? What have you done with the rest of our goods, you scoundrel? Order, gentlemen, please. You have abused the trust placed in you, Captain. Your actions force us to take harsh measures with you. Have you ought to say? Aye. You got full value for your furs. The larger part of them did not survive the boy. What mean you? The hides were brittle, hard, unfit for use. And the fur came off near half the skin. It is no fault of mine. A likely tale. Your cargo was in good condition when you sailed. It's more likely that you let salt water get into the hole. Nay, my ship's as tight as any on sea. Then you must have packed our furs badly. Nay, not so. Or else you tricked us. I know the quality of my fur. I cure them with my own hands. I tell you, the fault was in the tanning and the curing. Oh, of course it was. You have my word for it. That's not enough for me. Or me. No, no. Hey, you need not take my word. Look here. Here's a letter from the agents in London. Let me see it. Willingly. But what say they, Governor? Hmm. It is as the master of the ship told us. Well, half our furs and hides were spoiled for want of proper curing. Why, then our trade is ruined. How can we get the tools and other things we need from England now? We've nothing else to trade. Our future here is doubtful unless we can improve our curing of fur skins. But how are we to do that? I know not how. I only know we must. And I can think of not. Well, perchance young Master Winthrop can help us. Yes. He found pitch and tar for us. And improved our soap making. Yes, yes, indeed. Yes, yes. that's true. Speak up then, John. What's to be done to save our trade? If we could only get alum, gentlemen, that would strengthen and preserve the fur hides so they would last the voyage. But we can't send to England for it. It would take the best part of a year. Then we must find it here. But where so rare a substance to be found in this barren wilderness? I know not. But God willing, we shall find it somewhere in this new land. After long weeks of patient searching, 
The younger Winthrop located shale that he thought might contain the precious alum. Next, he put this shale into an oven, which was heated by a special furnace he had built, and tried to extract the alum by roasting. The process was long and wearisome. Weeks passed, and still he seemed no nearer success than when he had started. It is a bright Sunday morning, and the elders of the Bay Colony are walking through the woods on their way to call upon John Winthrop. We asked your company this morning, Governor Winthrop, because there are some amongst us who are troubled over the strange conduct of your son, John. What troubles you about him, Master Buck? Well, he was not at the meeting house this morning. No, he wasn't, Governor. Well, perhaps he is ill, or there may be some other reason. In these times, we must beware of being overlax with those who neglect their duty. This time we spoke with John about his faith. And I am sure, friend Edwin, that John will have a suiting answer for us. Mm. Look, look, I see a glow in the workshop yonder. He's working at his furnace. Yes. Hmm? Let us judge him, Master Barclay, when we have heard what he has to say. Aye. Let us hear him first. Come. You go in first, Governor. Thanks. Good morning, John. Well, John, can you think of no better way to spend the Sabbath? Oh, good morning, Edwin. Father? My son. We came to see what kept you from the meeting house this morning. Why, this work, of course. I've been roasting different kinds of shale. You know, bits of rock. Trying to get alum from them. And have you succeeded yet? Nay, but I hope to extract it soon. Ah, that's what you told us yesterday and the day before and the day before that. There's great need. We've got to find alum to save our fur trade and soon. Every day counts, Edwin. If I let the fires go out, it will take two days to start them up again. Mm, there's something in what he says, Edwin. Yet it does not seem right to me. But don't you see, Edwin? If we lose our fur trade, then we cannot get those things we need from England. And without them, we cannot live here and worship in freedom. In the freedom we sought by coming to this new land. Mm, this freedom to worship in our own way is very dear to us. Perhaps if John were permitted to continue his work. Aye. Aye. There are many ways of serving God. Perhaps serving us here in the Bay Colony is John's way. And so John Winthrop, the younger, became the first and only man in the Bay Colony permitted to work on Sundays. But months passed and still he had not succeeded in his task. Again and again he experimented in various attempts to extract alum, only to meet failure each time. Late one night he is busy at work with his retorts and kettles in the rough laboratory in his log house. His wife enters. Must you work so late, John? Three days now since you've slept. Uh, no, can I now, Elizabeth? I'm in the midst of a new experiment. Ah, but can't it wait a little longer? Ah, nay, good wife. I must wait up till I see if this turns out better than my other tests. Then can I not help you, husband? Aye. The shale has boiled long enough in the kettle now. You could steady these glass beakers for me while I pour the fluid off. Aye. What's in the kettle, John? Small pieces of shale. First, I roast them. And then put them in boiling water to dissolve out the salts. Aye. Uh, uh, take care, Elizabeth. The scalding hot. Now the second glass. There. She's finished. Set them down on the table, Elizabeth. Is that all, husband? Nay. Now I must wait. But, John, how can you tell if you've drawn the alum out? I won't know until the liquid in the beak is cooled. Then, if God wills I should succeed, the alum will form crystals on the bottom. And if no crystals form? Then... Then I must try again. What are these other glasses, John? Shall I clean them? Uh, nay, Elizabeth, don't touch them. They, too, contain dissolved shale. I set them there to cool earlier this evening. Oh, so long have I watched them. Scarce do they seem more than a blur before my eyes now. Is there aught else I can do to help you? Oh, nay, Elizabeth, go rest again. Only God can help me now. I know. Oh, Elizabeth, if only I can find the way... I must. The whole colony counts on me to succeed. So much depends upon it. And yet I... You'll find a way, John. Oh. I'm sure of it. Come in. Oh, it is you, Father. My son. What brings you and Edwin here at this hour? We saw your light as we were passing by. We missed you at the meeting house again tonight, John. Oh, I could not leave my test. God will forgive you. Now a great need. But tell me, son, have you found the way to get alum yet? Nay, 
But I still hope to extract it from this shell. His plain providence finds no favor in your work. There's no time for this foolish meddling with kettles. We must get along as best we can without the fur trade. Find something else to take its place. I don't intend to give up yet. What's in this glass, John? Oh, uh, some of the liquid I've boiled from the shale, Father. Hmm. Well, what, uh, what else is in it? Why, nothing. Why do you stare at it so? Look, John. Some strange substance forming on the bottom. Oh, quick, let me see. It seems to come from nowhere. Like a miracle taking place. At last. At last. What is it, my son? The crystals are forming. See? Crystals of Alum. 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 Are you sure? Yes. Yes, they could be nothing else then. Then our fur trade, our colony, is saved. But alum was only one of many things which the younger Winthrop developed for the early colonists things essential to the growth and success of the new land. He dedicated his entire life to the public need. After 18 years as a magistrate and member of the Executive Council of the Bay Colony, he became the first governor of Connecticut. During these years, he maintained a steady correspondence with friends in England on scientific subjects. In 1662, these friends, meeting in Gresham College in London, organized the Royal Society for the Improvement of Knowledge. Unanimously, they elected Winthrop a charter member. Winthrop has come to London for a visit. It's a great pleasure to have you in our company, Master Winthrop. You do me great honor, sir. You honor us by accepting. We have long followed your researches, Master Winthrop. I dare say more of your papers have been read before the society than those of any other person. You have indeed added greatly to the scientific knowledge of the world, sir. You are too kind to me, gentlemen. I only hope I shan't disappoint you on my work after I return to Massachusetts. Oh, come now, Winthrop. Certainly you don't intend returning to America. I plan to sail within that. Oh, look here, you cannot do that. But the chemist of your reputation, Winthrop, you must give up such an idea. You are too great a man to bury yourself in that wilderness. There's work to be done there, Brereton, as well as here. But if you stay here in England, you'll be able to do great things. The society will give you every possible assistance. You'll have supplies, instruments to carry on your experiments. Across the sea, you'll be alone in your work. You'll have nothing. But my work lies in the colonies, gentlemen. You see, I believe in the new world. That someday America will become a great country in her own right. John Winthrop's confidence in his adopted land was not misplaced. America was destined to surpass his fondest hopes. And this first American chemist did much to make his own dreams come true. Working virtually alone and with meager facilities, John Winthrop pioneered in scientific research and blazed the way for the thousands of chemists who have followed him. Last year, America's chemical industry celebrated the 300th anniversary of the enterprise which he founded in 1635. Tonight, it is fitting once more to pay tribute to John Winthrop for his example of patience, of courage, and the determination to make life better for his fellow man. All outstanding traits of those who have marched in the cavalcade of America. years have passed since John Winthrop laid the foundation of the chemical industry in this country. America has come far since those days, and chemistry has played a leading role in that swift-moving pageant of progress. The pioneers found the land magnificently endowed with natural resources, and those who followed have utilized nature's bounty to create for Americans the highest standard of living the world has ever known. By far, the greatest part of our nation's advance has taken place within the last few decades. Previously, man had been dependent almost entirely on natural materials to supply his needs. Wood was known only as wood. Cotton is cotton. Coal is coal. Then chemists began to discover the remarkable riches that nature had stored away in such materials. 
Today, in addition to their time-honored uses, such natural materials as wood and cotton are converted through chemistry into rayon yarn for lovely fabrics, lacquer for your automobile and furniture, the transparent wrapping that protects your packaged food, coated fabrics for furniture upholstery and washable window shades, plastics for safety glass, toilet wear, and scuffless heels, and many other products of beauty and utility. The chemist also has explored the mysteries bound up in a lump of coal. From coal tar, chemistry produces drugs to allay pain, a chemical rainbow of beautiful colors, the flavors of rare fruits, exotic perfumes, and chemicals that add life to automobile tires and many other essentials of modern living. The chemist has helped banish the likelihood of famine by creating products that protect food crops from insects and bees and other chemicals that improve crop yields. Through the chemist's contributions, we have finer cars, better gasoline. We have household refrigeration, conditioned air, new fabrics, fadeless colors, and more comfortable homes. So, in 1936, America can give thanks for resources of which the early settlers never dreamed. The chemist has unlocked the real treasure house of nature. Every day sees him seeking to improve existing products and to develop new ones, striving always to achieve as DuPont expresses it, better things for better living through chemistry. Next week at the same time, our program will dramatize incidents from the life of Edward McDowell, well-known American musician and composer, when DuPont again presents The Cavalcade of America. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.